Hey, welcome back. My name is Charlie Solis. Today I'm going to go through my vacuum chamber shell and tube heat exchanger condenser that I will be using for my Tesla turbine steam system, also known as a cryophorus. A lot of people you call the system cold steam or vacuum steam. If you're not familiar with this, it is the exact same system that's used in ocean thermal energy conversion plants. They use the temperature gradient of surface warm water and deep cold water to generate power by boiling steam in a vacuum chamber and then running that and expanding that through a turbine and then condensing it on the other side of the turbine with the cold water. Essentially, we're going to be simulating that same temperature gradient by my, my goal will be to use solar. Anyone else looking out to copy this, you can use wood burning, you can use propane, you can use natural gas. You, anything you can use to have, generate heat, you can pile up your compost if you have a farm and use the heat from the decomposition and generate enough power to either heat your home or generate some electricity. Now, again, I wanna stress that this is not new. The cold steam, vacuum steam, these vacuum chamber systems with the turbine, none of this is new. This has been done for a hundred years in ocean energy conversion plants. around the world. There haven't been too many of them. It's kind of been shelved by a lot of countries. Even in the US, we had a pretty big initiative by the government that had millions of dollars funded for it. To give you a little bit of a history, Darsan Vall was one of Tesla's friends. He came up with the idea for using the temperature gradient between warm surface ocean water and deep ocean water for generating power by using a low pressure chamber system to be able to boil some motive fluid with the heat energy out of the warm water and then be able to condense it on the other side of the turbine with the cold cooling water from below. He came up with this in the 1880s um, and then in 1930 and in the third 1930s, uh, George S. Claude. For the record, this is George S. Claude as in the, the Claude air liquefaction system. He did the first benchtop model and the first full-size plant model on a ship. There's a story about some accident happening, some storm, I believe, destroyed the pipe. In the description, I'll post a link to a little bit of a history behind that as well. You can look it up yourself. So in, I believe it was either 1930 or 1935, Tesla came out with his article, Our Future Motive Power. Um, and in this article, he goes through how to fully implement his turbines into in the vacuum system for utilization with not just ocean thermal energy gradients, but with geothermal steam, with solar, with again, with any kind of heat source, any kind of low grade heat source. Think about every chimney stack coming out of every factory, it's dumping hot enough exhaust out of it that we could be generating at least some kind of electricity with it. It's not gonna be all of it, but 20% better than nothing. I'll put a link to the Our Future Motive Power uh, article in the description. I highly suggest it, it's a really good read. Um, it's pretty funny, I keep finding people on the internet that want to say that Tesla had no understanding of physics and someone specifically said he didn't have a higher than high school or gymnasium level of physics and chemistry and it's, it's just it's just asinine um this paper alone his article alone is just a wonderful expose on how well he understood the thermodynamics that are have again been widely in use for almost a hundred years now and have been shown to work and it, this is this is one of those things that just really not talked about with Tesla. People like to focus on his electrical energy stuff, and even then, he still they still like to silo into a handful of patents that most people get wrong in the first place. <laughs> But yeah, check out that article. There's a couple other articles in the, link in the description below. I think you'll really enjoy them. They're a lot of uh, lesser known, but really good meaty, dense information from Tesla that I highly suggest to, for reading. One of the things I wanted to go through that a lot of people might not realize with this system, that we will be able to get near sit whole system efficiencies upwards of like 75 to 90% efficient for a pretty distinct reason. Um, irrelevant to how effective the turbine is at converting the heat energy into electrical energy, 
the exhaust coming out of the turbine in the vacuum chamber will be going to the condenser and the heat energy that's left over not used by the turbine will then have to be extracted out of the condenser to condense it and maintain that vacuum. The heat from the shell, the heat exchanger in here needs to be put somewhere. Typically if it's summer or you live in warm areas, you'll probably use the outside. If you check out my video, I had an idea to use one of Nikola Tesla's fountain patents as a air to water heat exchanger to remove the heat really effectively with the air. Another thing that I'm going to be doing and how we're going to get the high efficiencies is in another video, I have built a radiant heat exchanger, radiant water heater for my workshop here. And eventually I'll be building one for my house such that the heat that will be pulled out of the condenser side of the turbine that's not used to make electricity can then be used to circulate through the lines that are heating my garage and heating my house. And in, in effect, however you generate your heat, you can take some of it and make electrical energy with it with your turbine. And what's left over you can then use to heat your home. And it then can make your whole system efficiency in the 75 to 90% efficient. Now that's not accounting for how efficient your collector is. I'm basing that number off of you have a hot tank, it's a thermal battery and it's at a certain temperature and there's X amount of thermal energy in that thermal mass. How much of that energy when you extract it through the system can be turned into electrical energy. That's the efficiency I'm talking about. Now that, that'll be for future videos to actually test how effective this turbine is at converting some of that heat energy into electrical energy but as as it stands though what we're working on is as well to work for radiant heating with the same steam system because you can actually make a whole vacuum line system in your in your workshop that you can boil steam in a hot tank area and have that vacuum steam go and go through your lines and as it condenses through the lines that is in your your home or the area that you want to heat the heat that's given off due to the latent heat of condensation is then used for heating. This is why we use steam specifically for heating is it can hold a lot of energy in that, that form. When we do the turbine and the cryophorus for vacuum steam or what's also called cold steam, you're going to want a motive fluid that's going to have the lowest latent heat of vaporization because that latent heat of vaporization energy in theory is, is not usable for the expansion of the steam through the turbine. Now I'm not going to say that it's, it, it's unusable because you can use heat exchangers to do boiler feed water preheating which essentially will then be able to extract some of that energy that's leaving that's not being used to then heat up water that's going back to the boiler and that, that in turn then can make it so that you can recoup that heat and reuse it but it's, it's not going to be an infinite loop or anything it's just a recoup to raise the efficiency of the system. Uh, and Tesla has a patent, GB186083, where he does a combustion plus steam turbine all in one where they go into the turbine in a single nozzle, or there's dual nozzles, but together the steam and combustion go together into the turbine. And any of the heat energy that's not used in the turbine for electrical energy then goes out the exhaust and he routes the exhaust through another boiler. All of the heat energy that's left in the exhaust then goes to raise more steam that's then brought to the the combustion steam tube. By utilizing the leftover heat in the exhausts, it doesn't have to be thousands of degrees Fahrenheit or Celsius to boil and bring up really good efficiency. All it needs to do is supply the last bit of energy to go over the point of going from liquid to a vapor, where at that point you have a you can have a wet steam and you go and send it down the, the coaxial tube that the combustion and the steam is going through together, and all of the heat energy is put into the steam as they mix, and Tesla says the one of, whether one is moving faster or one is hotter, they will aspirate the other. And as they go into the turbine, they will meet, meet the same temperature, and all of the thermal energy can be utilized through expansion into the turbine. An interesting side part of that, about this is in normal gas turbines, you usually shove a lot more air in with the combustion uh, stoichiometric mixture because you want to use that extra air for cooling. You don't want the parts in the system to actually overheat. What Tesla designed in GB186083 was a way to cool the combustion chamber with colder steam. It is still steam at 100 degrees Celsius, but when you've got a combustion chamber that wants to be glowing red hot, 
your 100 degrees Celsius steam will easily cool down that roasting hot combustion chamber and in effect dumping much of that heat into the steam and steam is really really good at holding in energy that's for use utilization through expansion and heating so he makes it so that the centrifugal compressor on the actual system that provides the the air for the combustion it makes it so the centrifugal compressor does not need to supply all the extra air for cooling too and that's a lot of power difference to not have to supply when i can't off the top of my head think of the fuel mixture ratio that i'll probably put it up here in the corner but there's way more air than that's needed for the combustion in most gas turbines that don't utilize steam in it for cooling what this does is then it literally utilizes the loss in the turbine or from out of the turbine into a boiler to raise the steam and then also provide steam for expansion and cooling while eliminating the need to take some energy off of what's being produced by the shaft whether you have the compressor on shaft or you have the compressor being powered by an electric motor powered by the turbine generator so when you eliminate the amount of a good amount of the energy needed for the compressor for combustion, you'll make your gas turbine way more efficient. Considering much of the energy from a gas turbine goes into the compression of the air that's used to be heated and then expanded through the turbine. If you don't have to compress nearly as much air for the turbine to work, and you can actually get your cooling and high pressure from not just superheating but overheating the steam as it's entering the turbine you're going to get a very very efficient outcome in the turbine as well let alone any energy that's not then used after the turbine in the boiler to raise more steam for the turbine can then still be used for heating because if it's at 100 degrees celsius or it, it stops being able to be utilized for specifically boiling as it goes below boiling point and while you can use some of that still for raising the temperature of boiler feed water being admitted in, you'll end up with a lot more heat that's a lot more water or exhaust that's still at about 30, 40, 50 degrees Celsius. That's very usable for heating, but you're not going to get too much more out of it with a turbine. Now, that's not to say it's not possible. I, don't, I just mean traditionally it's not used in the turbine in that way. So by utilizing this, this kind of holistic system that Tesla designed for his improvement patents on the turbine that I, everyone seems to sleep on, we're able to not just make an efficient turbine that uses combustion and steam and is not affected by the multi-fluid flow, but the loss that's not used in the turbine goes to raising more steam for the turbine to be you to use with more combustion to be heated and anything lost from that then can still further be used for heating for a combined heat and power system that has a really, really high um, overall system efficiency. Again, you can power that solar, wood burning, fuel combustion, any, anything you can imagine that generates heat, you can utilize as the, the heating section. Um, preferably the higher the temperature the higher the efficiency you're gonna get but as long as you're getting a complete combustion and you're utilizing all of the end you, you're you're I don't want to say it this incorrectly but if, as long as you're entrapping all of that energy to to the system and then utilizing it for something else somewhere else later in the system you're going to get a good efficiency on it and I, I some of you might say this is cheating but if we can eliminate heating that's eliminate an, an energy if I'm not paying for my heating bill, I could I don't mind paying as much for my electricity bill even if that's not covering it completely. If I don't have to pay for gas or natural gas or I don't I don't use much electric heating, but if I don't have to pay for that, that means my whole system really reduces my overall expenses on my my heating and energy needs. And I think a lot of people forget that we don't just use electricity, we have a lot of heating energy demands that aren't being met for most people.